In the history of the Church, there have been many different ways to be a Christian as a part of a religious order. For groups like the Dominicans, the Jesuits, and many others, there's a charism to live by and an order to join, one and the same. But what if I told you that the Franciscans were a little different? The charism of St. Francis was not contained to just one order, but in fact, so many orders, it's difficult to count. Let's start with the basics. Francis of Assisi was the son of a wealthy merchant who lived in the 13th century. After failing to succeed as a knight, he had a tremendous conversion and set out to live the gospel as simply and as purely as he could. After renouncing all of his possessions, Francis began by simply rebuilding old churches brick by brick, preaching to those whom he saw, begging for food when hungry, and all the while praying. There was nothing extraordinary or revolutionary about this life. All he wanted to do was live the gospel. He had no ambitions to start a new order, and he certainly did not act as if he was trying to change the church. But because God has a sense of humor, that's exactly what Francis did. Before long, 11 men left everything to join him. Within three years, they received a rule of life from the Pope and were an official order of the church. In 1209, the Order of Friars Minor was born. Shortly thereafter, his close friend and inspiration Claire of Assisi did the same. She renounced her noble status in society to join Francis's order. Because this was simply not possible at the time, given that she was a woman, Francis helped her to form her own way of life. In 1212, the poor sisters of the monastery of San Damiano joined the Order of Friars Minor in this way of life. By this time, the simple man who didn't want to found an order had actually founded two. But God wasn't done with Francis just yet. The simplicity of their life and the joy they showed for the gospel spread throughout all of Europe. In just 10 years, the friars grew to be more than 5,000 men, and the poor clares had influenced three more monasteries of women. Soon enough, it was clear that what they had founded was not just a pair of small penitential orders. They had started a movement. From the early centuries in the church, there existed what was called the order of penance. Uh, for people who were guilty of grave sins, gradually it expanded for those who wanted to live some type of penitential life. There were many of these groups of penitents at the time of Francis. In fact, when Francis and his followers were returning from Rome after having their way of life approved by the Pope, people asked them, who are you? And they responded, we are the penitents from Assisi. Francis was working with his own friars, he was working with Claire and her sisters, but he also was working with some of these groups of penitents, giving them some guidance and direction. By the hundreds, Francis found himself surrounded by these people. They were inspired by his life and wanted to live his charism, but they also didn't want to leave everything behind to do so. Some of them were married, some were secular priests. They couldn't all join the two orders, but they still wanted to be Franciscan in their normal lives. So what did he do? He founded another order. Before he died, Francis wrote these brothers and sisters of penance two letters, guiding them in their way of life, one of which remains the prologue to their rule even today. In 1221, they received official recognition from the church, and at that point, the three branches of the Franciscan order were firmly established. The first order for the religious men, the second order for the religious women, and the third order for the lay penitents. But, as you probably know, there are more than just three congregations of Franciscans in the world today. There are hundreds. So what happened? Well, here's the thing. The friars today often joke that if you want an order with direction and organization, in which things make sense and there's a plan, join the Jesuits. Francis was many things, and his impact on the church is unrivaled among the saints. But Francis was no administrator. He lived in the moment, acted from his heart, and wanted his brothers to do the same. I have done what it was mine to do. May Christ teach you what is yours. As a result, the First Order began to splinter even in his lifetime. Problems began to arise, especially over uh, the rule that prohibited the friars from touching money, especially with the large number. As the, the brothers engaged more and more in the life of the ecclesial ministries, um, it became necessary to provide support for them because they couldn't work. And some of the early brothers felt it was uh, it lost something of the early tradition and commitment to follow the example of Jesus. After about 200 years, the first order officially split in two in 1517. On the one hand were the conventuals, those who wanted to live in large convents, focus more on church ministries like parish work, and use money for the sake of their mission. On the other hand, there were the observants, those who wanted to observe the rule very strictly and literally, 
living very austerely in small houses and relying more on manual labor. As the church's largest religious order at the time, this was a cataclysmic break with many ramifications, an issue that surely distracted the church from its other problems of 1517. Sorry guys. With one official split, the precedent had been set and the floodgates were opened. Reform groups sprung up with zeal, wanting to go back to the earlier, truer ways. After a few years though, the youthful zeal slipped into practical necessity, and eventually a new, more youthful group would spring up to reform the reform. And there are so many of these groups that it can be often confusing to keep track of all of them. In 1897, groups like the Descalce, Reformati, and Recollects eventually dissolved back into the larger observant branch. But one 16th century reform group maintained its independence even today, the Capuchins. The Capuchins felt that in the, in the process of, of moving into you know, ecclesial ministries, um, something was lost, especially uh, the, the balance between prayer and contemplation. And so the Capuchin renewal or the Capuchin reform of the 16th century uh, wanted to recapture living the rule according to the intentions of Francis. So looking back to our chart, we see that there still remains three branches of the Franciscans, but there are now three branches within the first branch. Confused yet? I hope not, because that was the easy part. When we look to the third order, we see two distinct branches develop in the Middle Ages. On the one hand, there's the original lay penitent movement, those who remained in their way of life but wanted to come together for community and penance. And on the other are those who wanted to establish more traditional religious orders based on this third order way of life. The former is what developed today into the secular Franciscans. The latter is what developed into more third order regular groups than I can possibly count. But unlike the first order groups that came into existence as reforms of previous orders, most of the third order groups were established completely independent of one another. Most of the present groups of sisters were founded in the 1800s. And they were always founded for, to take care, to uh, do some ministry in the church and to fulfill a need that wasn't being met, whether it was taking care of orphans or education or health care or taking care of the elderly for foreign missions or whatever it might be. If a bishop had a major pastoral need in the diocese, the best way to attend to it was to found a religious community and to make that its mission. Rather than creating a new rule of life for every individual group, and there were plenty of them, bishops generally gave them an established one. In many cases, this was the third order regular rule of 1447. Roughly how many groups are we talking about here? As of 2012, there were 93 different religious congregations that followed the third order rule in the United States alone. With that many groups, how about we just name a few of the more popular ones so you can get the idea. There's the TOR brothers and sisters that run and work Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. The Franciscan Brothers of Brooklyn, teachers. The Bernadine Franciscan Sisters. The Friars and Sisters of Atonement. The Franciscan Missionaries of Mary. And of course, the Franciscan Missionaries and Sister Servants of the Eternal Word, founded by Mother Angelica, but not including Mother Angelica. So what about Mother Angelica, you ask? Well, her congregation is called the Poor Clares of the Perpetual Adoration, a group that was founded as a third order group in 1854, but became a second order group in 1912, eventually accepting the rule of St. Clair in 1984. Sheesh, isn't it complicated enough to keep track of all these orders when people aren't switching sides? Because of this, her group is not the only congregation within the second order, but it is the most recent to accept the rule. There's also the primitive observance Poor Clares, the Collatines, and the Capuchin Poor Clares. At this point, I am absolutely sure that you've given up on this video. Why, who wants to know this information, really? It's not like I can even tell you that we're done. There's still more. Since 1970, after going nearly a hundred years without a reform, the First Order Friars started up again with four more break-off groups. In 1970, two friars broke from the Conventuals to found the Franciscan Friars of the Immaculate, in 1987, Benedict Rochelle was among nine Capuchins that split to found the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. Only eight years after that, several of these Reformed Friars left again to live even more primitively, calling themselves the Franciscans of the Primitive Observance. And in 2009, David Engo left the Capuchins to found the Franciscan Brothers Minor. And that's it. No, nope, no more. I, at least no more from, I can't do it. I, if there's a new group, I'm sorry, but I'm done. But I don't want to end on a confused or negative note. Sure, there are lots of different types of Franciscans. And you might be wondering to yourself, why can't you all just get along? I'm with you. I hear you. 
Our history is by no means perfect, and like so many, we often march by the beat of our own drum. If the community isn't the way we want it to be, start a reform group. And yet, there's something to be said about unity and diversity. Remember how it all began 800 years ago. Francis did not set out to create an order. He did not sit down and think up clear rules and regulations so that we could all be alike. He set out to live the gospel as purely as he could and asked his brothers and sisters to do the same. As Franciscans, there are certainly guiding principles that should unite us all into one family. Poverty, humility, fraternity, care of creation, incarnational spirituality. But if our highest goal is to live the gospel, there are as many ways to do that as there are Franciscans. Some say that our divisions make us weak. I say that our charism is just too big to fit into one order. Special thanks to Father Michael Blastic and Brother Paul McMullen for their insights. If you'd like to see more, click here to subscribe, check out my blog at breakinginthehabit.org, and follow me on Facebook, Casey Cole OFM.